Meet the swinger, the Polaroid swinger. Hey everybody, our next camera is the Polaroid Swinger Model 20. Uh, it ran from about 1965 to 1970. The little ditty I was singing was from the advertising campaign. Uh, supposedly that was written by Barry Manilow and the ads, you can find them on uh, here on YouTube, just search for Meet the Swinger, features a very young Ally McGraw. Um, she lives in my adopted hometown, Santa Fe, patron of the arts, philanthropy, just an all-around good citizen. I've never met her, but she seems really cool. So this was called the Model 20, supposedly, because it was designed to sell for less than $20. In 1965, 20 bucks was a lot more than 20 bucks means today, but still, that was pretty cheap for a camera. Type 20 instant roll film came out with this camera. Uh, it was black and white, ISO 3000. That was the only kind of film available for this. I ended up using uh, Ilford Delta 3200-120 film. The original film gave you eight prints per roll. The image size was 5.4 by 7.3 centimeters. So a little shorter than like six by seven and a little bit wider than six by seven if you're shooting on 120. Has a 100 millimeter uh, fixed focus lens uh, from what I've read, I believe it is a two-element plastic lens. Uh, close focus is two and a half to three feet, so that's pretty good for a fixed focus lens. The manual warns that if you're too close to people, it'll kind of exaggerate what's in the center, so it'll make them look like they have a big nose or something like that. Has a single-speed uh, rotary shutter, one two hundredth, two hundredth of a second. Not bad for a rotary shutter, and this one seemed pretty accurate. It's not very bright. It's f17 at its brightest, and they didn't really give the other uh, f-stops. But doing some calculations based on uh, these distances in this window, and you're only supposed to use them for when you're doing flash, but this thing probably stops all the way down to f340. And you control the aperture by turning this knob around the shutter button. They get a lot of mileage out of this thing. When you squeeze this, it enables the meter. It makes an electrical contact. Turning it varies the aperture, and it's the shutter button. And it's an Everset kind of shutter. It'll just keep firing has a flash bulb socket built in, and this plastic here is the diffuser. Uses the little peanut, the AG1 bulbs. All of this is powered. It's got this little push in and pull out thing in the bottom. Two AA batteries. That powers the flash contact and the light for the meter. This camera will work just fine without batteries. You just won't get any metering. Um, because you're manually controlling the aperture here, and the uh, the shutter is fixed. The meter is really interesting in this thing. You squeeze the sides of this knob, and it makes the electrical contact and lights up this red window below the viewfinder. I'm not sure if I can get a good close-up picture, but I will try. And then you turn it, and there's a word yes in there. It's kind of an extinction meter. And you turn it until the word yes against this kind of checkerboard red background is the clearest. And that tells you that your exposure is set by setting the aperture. And that works by this knob while it's changing the aperture in the in, behind the lens or in between the two elements, I think. It's also doing the same thing to this window here, which goes to the metering circuit. There are instructions for using the camera. Polaroid loved to kind of lay out things in simple steps for people. It was red, white, and blue. So red, 
set your exposure, white, take the picture, and then blue, and this one's modified so I can't really show you, but blue was pull the film out. It's got a cutter in here, or it had a cutter in here, and the film actually developed outside the camera in about 15 seconds. So red, white, blue, boom, you're done. I got the idea to give one of these cameras a, a whirl. I saw a, uh, a blog, and what he did was he spooled uh, 120 film onto the take-up spool so that the leader was on the inside and the tail of the paper was on the outside. And he just dropped the, uh, and he spaced using some coins. Drop the film here, and then in the dark bag, obviously, he got the paper where it was coming out where your prints would normally come out, and then felt the end of the 120, which just went down into this cavity. And then he had a piece of cardboard that was about the right uh, frame spacing, and just pulled it out and did the uh, advance that way. So I got inspired to see if I could do something a little more. I'm not sure if it was a great improvement over what he did. Um, I was a little overzealous gutting the thing. I put, pulled out all of the metal parts in the main part of the body, cut off part of the uh, film guide where it would guide it out of the camera, and took off these rollers. Then I realized that this lever that opens the back is actually moving these rollers in and out and they're hooking on to the metal part of the mechanism here. So that's why I had to glue this metal rod in here, whoops, metal rod in here so that it would secure the back again. Whoops. It actually worked pretty well. And then I added a red window um, and I got a little bit of frame overlap because I used the numbers for 6x6 six six, but the mask, I glued a piece, this is actually a piece of plastic from the old Fuji film pack film, it's a piece of plastic from one of those film packs because this side was just open originally and then I used some uh, closed cell foam because there's uh, some good metal pushers here that hold the, uh, the feed spool pretty well the take-up spool is a thumb screw. It's got the wide flat piece for turning with your thumb. And then I used the Dremel tool and ground it down to where it would fit inside the 120 spool. And then I used this wing nut. This was actually a tool for some build-it-yourself furniture. And got the, uh, got the length right, used this rubber washer for some uh, light proofing. And it just pulls out and you put it in the in the into the film spool and it advances pretty well. Um, it's not super super light tight where I modified the door because this thing was spring loaded and would open. I used some black silicone on this side and then put some cling wrap, just plastic wrap like in your kitchen on this side, closed it and let it dry. I didn't get it perfect but that has promised for making custom light seals. That's not bad. It's hideously ugly, but it works. Um, I took this on a hike and I used my trusty Nikon as backup. That's a little AEW-1000. That's why I'm filming this video. But I realized because this is Everset, even if I had this thing protected in my backpack, I could be taking pictures. So. I had a bunch of extra black tape. This has my notes about the aperture, and then that's my red window cover. But I had a bunch of pieces here just in case I found a leak or something. So I made a little film cap. So while it was in my backpack, I had it like that. That way, if it bumped against something, the shutter, hopefully it wouldn't uh, ruin the pictures too badly. All in all, I've got some frame overlap because my film gate is actually wider than 6x6. Six um, but I'm impressed with the pictures I got. A two element, plastic lens, and I got some decent images. Normally you get, what, I think 12 on 6x6. Six six. I got probably nine decent images, and if I crop into some of them, I'd probably have 11.
10 or 11. I can't remember how many I ruined. Um, anyway, I had a blast doing this. I have a couple more of these things. You know, you wandering through a thrift store and there it is for two bucks. So I tend to grab them. Um, I actually ordered uh, the sequel to this, the Sentinel. I've uh, got a couple of those. They're basically the same, except instead of the flash being here, it's a little thing that went on the side. So I'm going to try and refine these modifications and see where I can go with it. And I will see you then.